Uh, today we're going to try and throw some light on the potential similarities, differences and connections between the book historian, the book designer, the graphic designer, the design historian. Um, and we're going to base our observations on our experiences, Claire's and mine, um, as a design practitioner and a historian working together. So we work together often as a research partnership, and while there is a sliding scale of definition, by and large, I wear a design historian's hat, and Claire has a graphic designer's hat. Very attractive. Both of us teach, and both of us are doing PhDs. Um, and the issues that we encounter very often arise out of this kind of dichotomous nature of the shared vein of inquiry. So it's not going to be an exhaustive list of issues, um, and many of them, as we've explored them, um, have given rise to open-ended questions where there are kind of simultaneously right and wrong answers, depending on where you happen to be standing in relation to each discipline, and it's kind of that that we want to look at. Uh, so the first um, example of the dual character of this subject matter came about while we were organising the annual conference of A-Type I that took place in Dublin in 2010. Um, A-Type I is the premier, in fact the only, uh, worldwide organisation dedicated to type and typography. It's genuinely an actively international membership. This is what makes it dif different, that it is actually actively international. Uh, it includes a broadly distributed mix of typeface designers, typographers, historians, graphic designers, linguists, software engineers and designers, and many people who would identify with more than one of these titles. Uh, when devising the theme of the conference and writing the call for papers, we alighted on the subject of Ireland's literary heritage due to its familiarity and accessibility internationally and for its ability to span a wide variety of typographic and cultural interests, including the practices of book history and book making. Um, it also coincided with Dublin's designation as a UNESCO city of literature, and all of this suggests to us the title of the conference, The Word, you can, as you can see here. Given this theme, we fully expected to receive many submissions from the field of book history. After all, some of the most relevant contemporary writing about the material culture of the book, which of course includes typography, comes from this field. However, two interesting things happened. We received very few submissions from book historians, and what we did receive managed to get filtered out at peer review stage by the A-Type I programme committee. So something else that was interesting uh, about A-Type I and quite revealing in the terms of today's discussion was a stormy exchange that took place on this rooftop in Mexico City at a meeting between members of the A-Type I board and the organising committee about the use of the word paper as opposed to presentations to describe the call for submissions. The board was concerned that the term call for papers could be off-putting for some of A-Type I's constituency. So we very nearly ended up with a call for presentations, which would have raised distinct difficulties for potential speakers from within the academy in attracting, for example, funding. Uh, the idea of a presentation as opposed to a paper also touches on a much larger problem, and we argue that within this context it renders participants passive receivers of uh, information or even entertainment rather than active generators of their own epistemological field. Uh, a Type I's initial concern about the likely response of practitioners to the idea of submitting a paper points to an assumption about practitioners' limits of endurance. It suggests that there exists a perception that practitioners are either unable, unwilling, or both to engage with the currencies of scholarly activity. And this uh, misconception comes from within the field of practice itself. However, we feel that such a concern has no foundation. And indeed, the GradCam seminar group that we programme, Typography Ireland, provides a challenge to such assumptions. It's not so much the fact that a seminar like this exists within the academy that provides the challenge, but rather the content, the contribution from designers working outside the academy, and how that contribution intersects with content from practitioners um, working within it, the historians, theorists, printers, um, and others. Um, Again, we should probably point here to the fluidity of these categories um, and the inevitably false binary between inside and outside of the academy. And I've suggested there must be an awful lot of arachnid blood in design because most of us have at least one foot in several different camps. Um, however, um, this is Marcus Swan. I don't know if he's here today. Uh, however, no one is re required to abandon their disciplinary or interdisciplinary position. Uh, instead, we work to build a forum and a, and a currency for equal debate. It's by no means plain sailing, though. Even between Marianne and I, we often have 
very heated exchanges on, for example, the location of manhole covers on the spectrum of typographic interest. So this is uh, one point where Claire and I, and perhaps Phil, uh, part company, um, to Claire, she finds the people who find manhole covers and other details of lettering in the street um, interesting. She finds them themselves interesting. Um, but I'm with Jean-Francois Porches here, and I find manhole covers and commercial lettering on buildings interesting in themselves. Um, so often, uh, revealing observations come simply from such apparently neutral activities as compiling a reading list. At a recent Typography Ireland seminar where we made a first attempt to put together a bibliography for our reading group, we were presented with a difficulty. Only a very small percentage of the large volume of relevant material suggested uh, is actually peer-reviewed. So here's an example. So um, I wanted to find an article on the legendary designer Paul Rand, considered by some to be the father of modern American graphic design. So I went to the Design and Applied Arts Index, which is one of the largest databases of design-related publications, and happy days, I found 94 published articles. Great. So I happened to want a peer-reviewed article to circulate to my students for them to review. So I pressed the peer review button, as you can see here, and I got three. So I thought, OK, right, um, maybe this is just this particular database. So thinking it might be better to try a more general academic databases, I tried Academic Search Premier, and I carried out the same search. So I got 30 articles uh, for Paul Rand and Design. Um, I pressed the peer review button, and I just got the one. Um, it doesn't just end there. Uh, this issue is further underlined when one considers that unless we put iMagazine on the required, listing, uh, <coughs> required reading list for students, we're not really uh, teaching them properly. Yet iMagazine, despite featuring key contemporary graphic design writing, is a trade magazine, and this is how Rick Poyner once described the magazine to us. Um, and he's the editor of the He's the, the editor, the founder yeah, of the magazine. Yeah. Um, <coughs> thus, the Academy is forced to go outside of itself for its own required primary reading. This is just one example. Others are Creative Review um, and Print Magazine. There's also websites like Design Observer and um, the AIGA website. Again, they're, they're, they're non, all of them um, not peer-reviewed, and they're invaluable to the scholar of graphic design, absolutely invaluable. Um, while we acknowledge the presence of peer-reviewed journals such as Design Issues, Visible Language and Visual Communication, very little of the knowledge produced here, produced here finds its way back into the studio more generally. So what does that suggest? It would appear that because the locus of graphic design knowledge is positioned largely outside of the academy, the locus of knowledge about practice is as well. As Audrey Bennett has noted, what exists is an intellectual chasm between practice and research with practitioners leading the way. So with the regard to the uh, compilation of the Typography Ireland reading list, this leaves us in the unenviable position of having no recognised set of, kind of peer review criteria by which to decide on its contents. So we're actually left in the position of curating most of the reading list. In other words, everything is valid. Although, as we've seen from the Paul Rand count, the Academy might say that only three of those 94 articles could be described as such. So instead of starting the discussion at a level that examines or evaluates the inclusion of a relevant text within an established critical framework, we get embroiled perhaps in the various subjectivities that come into play, based often on the proclivities of the particip participants. Plenty of manhole covers when I'm in charge of the list. So this may lead to the entanglement in the construction of various dichotomies, which are again often false, such as the idea of the difference between the content of a book and its uh, value as an object, or, or both. We're also more likely to fall prey to the construction of a knowledge base that meets the, the needs and presents the views of dominant subjectivities. Currently, predominant graphic design or dominant graphic design discourse emanates from industries practising luminaries who produce, in the main, journalistically styled pieces. Uh, furthermore, for those undertaking PhDs whose aim is to write for and about practice without being practice-based research in itself, one often has to justify why one might have uh, one might be including such an elementary or non-peer-reviewed text as I frequently have. As Simon Downs uh, has noted, graphic design does not know what it knows. The significance of this comment also chimes with Christina Niederer's observation that tacit knowledge forms a substantial proportion of the knowledge drawn upon in order to practice graphic design. Um, 
This all relates to the wider issue of the Academy's difficulty in integrating the type of knowledge generated by practice-led disciplines, for example, graphic design, fine art and nursing. Uh, and this is because thus far its method of hypothesising and substantiating inquiry through research is based entirely mm. on language-based propositional knowledge, which makes it difficult to account for and validate knowledge based on procedural or experiential models. So, as you can see here, an emphasis on the verbal has led to a situation where the substantial body of knowledge for some practice-led disciplines may actually lie beyond the academy. As a result, it could be for this reason that a significant proportion of design knowledge, which is by definition tacit, is not contained in peer-reviewed design literature. Yeah, the inherent difficulty in translating design know-how into words structured in such a way that it meets the standard required of academic research is therefore reflected in the restricted number um, of peer-reviewed texts produced from within, from inside the practice-led field. Um, Further, the writing down of knowledge that can usefully be deployed within the context of practice is only successful if that knowledge can be integrated into the practical knowledge of the art. Uh, it cannot replace this knowledge. This is something else Niederer said. That's actually a quote, <laughs> that bit there. Um, so, uh, for example, graphic designer Paula Scher, who visited um, Dublin this weekend, uh, her statement, all the theory in the world cannot replace talent, um, is an interesting reflection of this point. From this, it is clear that she also situates propositional verbalised knowledge, or theory, as she calls it, beyond the domain of essential knowledge requirements for a practising graphic designer, as her use of the word talent seems to suggest that within this context, what is being referred to is tacit knowledge. Yet Cher's statement demonstrates that she herself has perceived a clear division between theory and her own knowledge of the, the experience of practice, reflecting Niederer's view that the lack of integration between the propositional and procedural knowledge within the context of the academy has indeed led to a dichotomy between theory and practice. So, how does this all relate to the topic in hand today? Well, one thing that we've observed, and perhaps incorrectly, book history and its output in the main seems to be contained and housed by the Academy. Because graphic design, and perhaps to a lesser extent book design, um, and their accompanying discourses are in the main positioned outside of the Academy, dialogue has not yet come naturally. Um, the consumption of the practice of the book, for example, um, and the practice of book design, um, the consumption of the practice of book design history happen in two very different places and, and these are kind of two extreme examples. Indeed a, a quote, uh, a description of Magma, this design bookshop that you can see here on the right, that we came across included the following remarks oh, sorry. <laughs> um, Magma continues to present graphic design to the masses. All books, magazines and graphic novels are faced out and stacked to the ceiling which results in quite a sight there are no sorry-looking spines here. So um, plenty of sorry-looking spines, obviously, in the, the long room. Um, book design, book history. Um, so one of the things we wanted to think about was this idea of consumption, production, mediation. Um, and book history, like design history, has a fascination with the material forms of books and, as such, has a good record of examining factors of their production. Here there is a clear intersection with certain areas of typographic history where the identification of particular type forms, for example, can help in the provenancing of, of books. Um, we were a bit concerned when we started to think about today that the purpose of today's workshop might be misunderstood as simply an opportunity for book historians to find out about how books are designed. And I think thankfully the programme demonstrates that that fear was unfounded. Communication between book historians and designers can provide a great deal more than simply helping understand why and how books are made. It can also throw light on the whole area of mediation, how book or how text becomes book. Um, from another angle, book history has a commendable record of work on the consumption of books. It's histories of readers and audiences of the interplay between production and consumption. The direction of the gaze of these inquiries is, we would argue, sorely lacking from graphic design epistemology with its persistent focus on luminary producers. We would argue that the most useful way to consider graphic design practice in the context of book history today is not just to think of practitioners as primarily readers or writers, but as mediators. 
Um, following Pierre Bourdieu, writers like Sean Nixon and Liz McFall explored the usefulness of his category of cultural intermediaries in understanding advertising practitioners. And it's a term that could possibly be ex extended to other areas of graphic design, including book design. Of course, the uh, use of the term cultural intermediary, like shop versus library, may already be raising hackles in this audience. Bourdieu's description of the term is pejorative. He sees nothing noble or... Um, or um, uh, OK, nothing no noble in the mediation of a new type of cultural capital, considering the constructs of cool or creative cultures as no less exclusionary than upper-class, educated or elite. Indeed, while the Academy has embraced the everyday, Nick Wilson has embraced it, I think, um, it retains a traditional resistance to the commercial. I think it's no surprise that the further the designer travels from an association with commerce, the more likely they and their practice are to be embraced by the Academy. <coughs> And we've probably, many of us have seen this anyway, Milton Glaser's kind of tongue-in-cheek, graphic designer Milton Glaser's tongue-in-cheek categorisation of the status of the arts. And what he's really trying to do here is to show the cultural capital accruing to each of these roles. Um, we might actually ask a question ourselves, might ask ourselves um, what we think of Glaser's um, placement of book design on this scale. Would we like to move it further up? Would we like to move it out of this list? Um, OK. Oh, yeah. um, for our final observation, we suggest that we um, all need to think not just about the objects of practice, but to focus on practice itself as a mediator. As Eva Horn writes in her questioning of how media studies defines its discipline, regarding media as processes and events, observing their effects rather than their technological forms or ideological contents, also implies a broadening of their analytical frame, which becomes more a certain type of questioning than a discipline in itself. So today's broadening of the frame will hopefully allow for more inclusivity between our disciplines and our interdisciplines. So um, I think the thing is to say, let's get mediating, as they might say at the beginning of a yoga class. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.